This is another tutorial on homeostasis. Today we're going to look at glucoregulation. In other words, how our body regulates blood glucose levels. So, firstly, can you explain how blood glucose levels are controlled by our body? Then can you compare the causes and treatments for type 1 and type 2 diabetes? And finally, can you link the idea of body mass index to type 2 diabetes? So sugar is an important fuel for all living organisms. But that doesn't mean we can guzzle it down without any restraint. If we don't control our blood sugar levels, it can lead to serious problems. So why do we need to control our blood glucose levels? Well firstly, if we have too low blood glucose levels, that affects our rate of respiration, that chemical reaction that gives us energy. If we don't have enough sugar or glucose for prolonged periods of time, we can end up in a coma, which can lead to death. If our blood glucose levels are too high though, it can lead to severe dehydration and if we don't basically dilute ourselves, it can also lead to death. Fast food restaurants are big fans of putting way too much sugar into their drinks, so they end up giving you drinks that will never quench your thirst, leaving you always wanting more. So let's say we've just eaten a food source which contains a lot of glucose. So glucose will flood our bloodstream. Now, this has an interesting effect on surrounding cells, which contain water. Water will move to where the glucose is, and therefore our cells will start to become dehydrated. Now, obviously, our cells need water to transport all those chemicals needed for vital chemical reactions which keep us alive, such as respiration. Also, because now we have more water in our bloodstream, it can increase our blood pressure, which can lead to other problems. So, watch this quick demonstration. Here I'm cutting an apple. The apple will represent our body cells. Now the sugar I'm putting on top will represent the glucose that's entered our bloodstream. Now using time-lapse camera, look what happens. You can see water starts to leave the apple to dilute the sugar. And there you have it. Look at all that water come out. We say here that water has moved by a process called osmosis, where it moves to an area of high sugar concentration from an area of low glucose concentration. So now let's get the first aim under our belt, where we'll look at the negative feedback pathway that allows us to control blood glucose levels. Again, we're going to use the similar checkpoints, stimulus to receptor, to effector, to response. So let's just say we've eaten sugary food and our blood glucose level has increased. That would be the stimulus, the change to the internal environment. Now there are two receptors here. The first is the hypothalamus, which is that part of the brain which monitors the blood. The second is the pancreas, a feather-shaped organ which feeds into the small intestine. To be honest, if you just focus on the pancreas in an exam, you should be fine. The liver is another important organ, though it's not a receptor, but we'll look at that in a second. So the pancreas is the key effector here, and the pancreas will secrete a hormone called insulin, which you can see are these green triangles here. Now insulin is a hormone, so it's a protein. Now insulin has two effects. The first is it will bind to the protein receptors on cell membranes. So you can see here's the hormone insulin, here's the protein receptor, which is embedded on the cell membrane. That opens channels allowing glucose to enter the cell where it can be used for the process of respiration. So insulin binds to cells allowing cells to take in glucose for respiration. Now there's a good chance we'll take in too much glucose for our body to actually deal with. So we have another solution. Insulin can bind to liver cells. That will allow glucose molecules to enter the liver where the individual glucose molecules are stitched together to make a long carbohydrate called glycogen. In the form of glycogen, the glucose cannot affect the process of osmosis and lead to dehydration. So insulin allows glucose uptake by the liver where it is converted into glycogen. It's important to note here that glucose is a carbohydrate and so is glycogen. The difference is glucose is a monomer, a single unit, but glycogen is a polymer. So that means many single units joined together or bonded together. The response is blood glucose levels fall. So now let's see what happens when blood glucose levels fall. So let's say you've been doing exercise using that glucose in respiration, so your blood glucose levels are going down. And if you're not careful, we could collapse as our glucose fuel runs low. Again, the pancreas is that receptor that detects the change in blood glucose levels. 
Once again, the pancreas is the effector, but this time it releases a different hormone called glucagon. glucagon. Now, one of the most common mistakes students make is mixing up the carbohydrate glycogen with the hormone glucagon. Just remember, when your glucose levels are down, in other words, when your glucose has gone, you need glucagon. So glucagon will bind to liver cells as well. Then the liver will convert this insoluble carbohydrate glycogen into the soluble carbohydrate glucose, which will then enter our bloodstream. So the job of the liver here is to convert glycogen back into glucose in response to the hormone glucagon. The response of course is our blood glucose levels rise. So let's piece this all together. Stimulus, blood glucose level rises. Receptor, the pancreas detects the rise in blood glucose levels. Effector, the pancreas secretes insulin. Insulin has two effects. One, insulin binds to cells allowing them to uptake glucose for respiration. Two, insulin binds to liver cells, allowing glucose to enter the liver where it is converted into glycogen. This results in the blood glucose levels falling, and that achieves negative feedback. In other words, that change has been reversed. Now let's look at the flip side of that. Stimulus, blood glucose levels go down, probably because we've been expending too much energy. Receptor, the pancreas detects the fall in blood glucose levels. Effector, the pancreas now produces the hormone glucagon. Glucagon binds to the liver, which converts glycogen back into glucose, which then enters our bloodstream. The response is blood glucose level rises. And once again, we have achieved negative feedback, a reversal of the initial change. And that is how you can explain how blood glucose levels are controlled by our body, or more specifically, through negative feedback. Now diabetes is a condition where we cannot regulate our blood glucose levels and this is becoming an increasing problem within our species. You can link this to our lifestyle largely, although genetic factors can play a role. There are two types of diabetes, type 1 diabetes and type 2, which is becoming more and more common. So what's the difference? Firstly, type 1 diabetics, they cannot produce the hormone insulin. So you can see the spluttering pancreas here cannot produce that hormone. Type 2 diabetics, however, can produce the hormone insulin, it's just that their organs have stopped responding to it. So the target organs will not respond to insulin. Type 1 diabetes can be caused due to genetic factors, inherited factors, but also can be caused by your lifestyle choices. Type 2 diabetes has been heavily linked to obesity. Obesity is a condition which can be characterised by quite extreme or significant weight gain. This logically makes sense. If your organs are surrounded by, let's say, excess fat, then obviously it's harder for insulin to bind to those cells. Type 1 diabetes is not curable, but it is treatable. The first thing you may notice is diabetics will inject insulin, basically the hormone they cannot produce. Now, insulin must be injected into the subcutaneous fat. In other words, the fat layer just below our skin. Secondly, it can be treated by controlling our diet, so obviously having low sugar foods, putting less strain on our body to deal with that rise. Thirdly, having a healthy, active lifestyle, regular exercise can also help control it. So basically, depending on your diet and how much you exercise, your need for insulin will vary. If you lower your sugar intake and you exercise regularly, you will need less insulin. Type 2 diabetes, however, can be controlled and cured. Makes sense. If weight gain was the cause of your diabetes, then obviously losing weight will help. So again, controlling your sugar intake and also uh, eating healthily, as well as exercising more, might mean you don't actually need to inject insulin at all. So type 2 diabetes can be regulated with just these two alone, healthy diet and regular exercise, though some people may choose to inject insulin as well, especially if they're finding it hard to discipline themselves to do these two things. So just another overview, remember type 1, the pancreas cannot produce insulin. This could be linked to genetic factors but also lifestyle factors. The treatment is injecting insulin into your subcutaneous fat and basically controlling your sugar intake and also having a healthier active lifestyle. Type 2 diabetes, the pancreas does produce insulin but the organs have stopped responding to it. So target organs won't respond, it's been linked heavily to obesity. Type 2 diabetes can be cured. You can do this by controlling your sugar intake, having a healthy diet and regular exercise, though some people may want to supplement that with insulin intake. 
So that is how you compare the causes and treatments for type 1 and type 2 diabetes. So now let's look closely at the relationship between type 2 diabetes and your body mass, or more specifically, your body mass index. So this chart shows information on your body mass index, and it takes into account two factors. Your mass in kilograms, that's technically incorrect, you say mass. For you physicists, weight is a force and should be measured in newtons, so that's a bad picture. So it takes into account your mass and also your height. So basically, your body mass index is a measure of how heavy you are for your height. Now you can calculate this quite easily using this equation. So your mass in kilograms divided by the square of your height. So let's look at one work through example. Let's say this person here has a height of 1.8 meters. Remember the height is measured in meters. And they have a mass of 70 kilograms. So quite simply, all you have to do is divide that 70 kilogram mass by the square of the 1.8 meter height. Now I recommend working out the square first. So if you do that first, you'll find that the square of the height is 3.24 meters. So now it's easy. You just divide 70 by 3.24. And that gives this person a body mass index of 21.6. So you can see this chart contains different bands of body mass index. So if you fall into this category, in other words, your body mass index is less than 18.5, you are deemed underweight. If it falls within 18.5 and 25, you have a normal range of weight. At 25 to 30, you're overweight. And above 30, you are obese. So remember this one. Above 30 means you're obese, and that can be linked to diabetes. This person, however, has a body mass index of 21.6. They fall into the normal range. Just be aware that this system isn't perfect and is open to error. For example, you could have a very large mass, which is largely accounted for by muscle rather than body fat. So that could give you a BMI greater than 30, but wouldn't necessarily mean you are obese in terms of fat content. So if you remember, if you have a body mass index greater than 30, then you are obese, and obesity is linked to type 2 diabetes. And that is the final aim.